Welcome, lovely listener, to the programme. You're tuned to BBC Radio London's Breakfast Show. I'm Vanessa Feltz, and it's six minutes past eight, Friday the 23rd of July. Hope your morning's going swimmingly well so far. If you're about to break up from school for the summer, I hope you have lots of fun this summer and thoroughly enjoy yourself. Um, We're so pleased to have you aboard today. It's lovely to have your company. And if you want to phone me on any subject, it's 0800 731 2000. We're talking about, though, the families of the victims of the Croydon Trap crash which occurred as you'll remember in 2016 and these families are demanding a new inquest into their deaths the headline in the times today families furious at tram crash verdict families of victims of the croydon tram disaster called the inquest into their deaths a farce yesterday and demanded a new hearing on the worst crash of its kind in a century yesterday a jury at croydon town hall reached a verdict of accidental death rather than unlawful killing Many don't understand why TfL, the tram operators, or drivers on the line were not called as witnesses. Seven people died in 2016, and more than 50 people were injured when the tram they were travelling in derailed. It was travelling three times faster than the speed limit. Daniel Wynne's grandfather, Philip Logan, was 52 and was killed in the crash. She spoke to me earlier and she said she believed the crash was caused by more than just a tired driver. Someone has to be held accountable for what happened that morning. I I fully understand that the driver was in charge of that tram that morning. However, I believe that the the issues stem further than just the tram driver. I believe that the issues stem right deep into the heart of these companies as well. So I I hold them um, accountable for what happened as well. And I think that is why it's so important to us, Mm. is that someone holds their hands up and says, we are sorry, we messed up. Um, and lessons are learnt from it because no other family should have to go through the pain that we are having to go through. Joining me on the programme, the new Conservative London Assembly member for Croydon and Sutton, Neil Garrett. Hello, Neil. Good morning. Good morning, Vanessa. Thank you for inviting me on. Yes. And, and in particular, can I say thank you for covering this story? I know it's a very important story. I think people, people are very pleased to see you covering it. Oh, you don't need to thank us for covering it. We've been covering it right from the very start. And I remember broadcasting live on the day it happened, and we were absolutely, of course, uh, first of all, aghast. Then, I think, disbelieving, because we had always thought, we'd all been brought up to think that, you know, travelling on a tram was about the safest kind of travel anybody could undertake. And and so we were shocked. We were, we were, we were absolutely <laughs> standard but we were heartbroken um, about this and we have covered it from, 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 from ever since as you quite rightly say and, and yes there's no need to thank us it's obviously it's our job to do it and we want to do it but tell me about your reaction to this verdict because I've just spoken to Danielle Wynn and she really she's very she's upset she's frustrated she's she's angry she's bewildered she's all sorts of things about this how about you well I listened to her earlier speaking to you and I, I, I think the, the frustration that I have and that I, I think the The disappointment that a lot of people here have is we were hoping that the inquest would finally answer some of the big questions that have been hanging over this crash for years, and the questions were not even asked. So, as you say, Transport for London and First Group, who run Croydon Trembling, they were not even invited to give evidence, even though people were pressing them to. Um, And so the sort of safety and management problems that have come to light were not even aired. And so I think the hope that this would bring some closure has been dashed because people have just got a new round of frustration about about the failure to get to the bottom of, of what's gone on and, and how to prevent it happening again, which is mm. the other important part. I mean, the families are very unhappy. We didn't hear from the driver at the inquest. inquest they know now um, that the coroner refused to call a number of people that the victim's families wanted to call to give evidence about alleged safety failings. For example, the managers at the Tram Operations Limited and Transport for London. Do, did you have any understanding about why the coroner refused to hear from these people? Because people listening to this today might think, you know, what difference would it have made to the coroner if families felt better and better heard and acknowledged and seen and, and everything else if these people were allowed to give their testimony certainly in the Grenfell inquiry a great deal of attention has been made to the sorts of people that the families want to hear from and also giving families the chance to give their uh, point of view it's, it's it's been carefully considered the importance of this kind of thing hasn't it it, it has I mean I think the, the- The big thing for me, one of the big questions that remains is there were quite a number of safety red flags before the crash um, which were ignored. 
to give you some examples, so just 10 days before the crash, um, which was on the 9th of November, the 31st of October, another tram driven by a different driver went around the same bend within about two miles per hour of tipping over. So passengers were pushed against the outside of the tram as it went round. It was quite a frightening experience for people on the tram. Yes. Um, and there have been repeated examples on that same corner of trams having to apply the emergency brake. Um, it would be useful to know why none of that was followed up. Those were red flags that could have prevented it. Uh, eight years before the crash, the chief engineer of Croydon Tram warned about the specific danger of this. There's a particular problem here where you have a long, fast, straight section of track, a 50-mile-an-hour speed limit on a very long, straight section with a very tight 12-mile-an-hour 12, 12 bend at the end of it. The chief engineer warned in 2008, following a, an accident elsewhere, that there were two specific points on Croydon Tramlink where this was a risk, and he wanted to put in advance warning signs so that, because the danger is that drivers become a bit sort of disoriented or they lose their speed and depth perception and they come into the corner too fast, he wanted to put in advanced um, warning signs to the drivers to, to give them better chance to slow down. Um, the tram operator and TFL refused to put those signs in. He actually put in, in another location just near here, he actually put the signs in, uh, he felt so strongly, and they were bagged over by the tram operator. I think the inquest might have been, it would be nice if they could have asked TFL or, Trump or the first group who run the tram why they did that. I mean, I have a, I um, have a statement that I have to read out to you uh, from the TFL Commissioner Andy Byford, who says, we've supported the inquest and coroner throughout the process in every way we could and have introduced a number of additional safety measures on the tram network in recent years to ensure that nothing like this can ever happen again. Um, yes. That's what he says. Do you feel that that is the case? <laughs> Yes. I mean, I've had meetings with TFL about this, and they, they go through all of the recommendations in the original crash investigation by the RAIB, and all of them have now been done. That includes advanced sign, uh, advanced uh, warning signs. It now includes an automatic braking system, so if the tr um, driver tries to drive into the corner too fast, the tram will slow itself down. So those things have been done. I think the question is why... I mean, there's... The tram automatic braking system is a complicated issue, but advanced warning signs, that's a pretty basic thing. You've got your chief engineer telling you that he thinks you should do it. He actually goes to the trouble of putting them in off his own bat, mm -hmm. and then they take them out. I mean, that's not, you know, a complicated issue that, that requires a full investigation. It's pretty, it's pretty difficult to understand why they wouldn't have just kept those in. And, I mean, another issue has been around fatigue management. So yes. there's, there's the most likely... Uh, cause of this is that the driver sort of nodded off, had a micro sleep, as they call it, um, the long, slow blink, as some of us think of it. That seems to be what happened, and that he kind of came to and was slightly disorientated. Um, so fatigue management, which is the sort of industry term, is about making sure that drivers, um, and it you know, applies to train drivers, bus drivers, airline pilots, to make sure they turn up for work and they're in a fit state. They have this fatigue management process that's about making sure drivers are fit, making sure their shift patterns don't leave them um, sort of jet-lagged by different shift patterns. Three quarters of the drivers before the crash were concerned that um, first group's fatigue management process on the tram wasn't adequate, so that's another warning sign. Why was that not addressed? And very closely related to that, the investigation found that there's a culture of blame at uh, first group and at TFL where drivers were wary of flagging up these issues because they felt that they would be blamed. And I think as, you know, as you or I as passengers or your listeners as, as passengers or people who share the road with buses or trams, I think we would assume that the people who run these systems put a priority on safety. And if there's a safety issue that gets plugged up, they would try to address it. And I think one of the wider, very worrying issues that comes out of this is the culture at, uh, at Transport for London about sort of trying to suppress problems and stop them coming to light or stop them becoming an embarrassment rather than trying to proactively address them. So as, you, as TFL statement says, they have now done all the things that they were required to do by the crash investigation. As far as I know, that is correct. I think the, the, the lingering question is the culture that required there to be a formal investigation and formal recommendations before they did some quite basic and obvious things. And well, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. That's Neil Garrett there, Conservative London Assembly Member for Croydon and Sutton. And I do have one uh, comment from the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, who said, the seven people who were killed will always be in our thoughts and we will now fully consider the jury's conclusions and take forward any further learnings 
as appropriate. Uh, if you want to call me about that, please do. I have this, though, from Paul in Crystal Palace. It's an email, and this is what Paul says. Morning, Vanessa. I work outside East Croydon Station. It's one of the main tram stops on the network, and is very close to Sanderlands, where the tram crashed in 2016. I was working on that day. It was a horrible day, as East Croydon was set up as a base for the emergency services. Of course, that day was far worse for the victims and their families. I'm shocked, but not surprised, that yet again, an inquest has in reality failed to apportion blame or establish culpability on any organisation or person. Of course, says Paul, it would be all too easy to blame the driver, and I'm sure in the last five years that man has gone through hell. Yes, he was driving the tram, and he may have had a micro-sleep. However, anyone who travelled on the trams prior to the crash, as I did, I'm sure would agree that many trams would take that bend at speed or would break sharply when approaching it. I myself often thought the tram I was on was going too fast, and I also thought it would only be a matter of time before an accident occurred. Sadly, just like others have said, my concerns were proven to be right. It seemed to me at the time that precautions and safety measures were not what we may have expected, otherwise the trams would not have been able to make that bend at speed. These days, the trams that take that bend, they take them at much lower speeds. They virtually crawl along that section of track. It's a disgrace that it took the deaths of people for such safety measures to eventually be implemented. I, for one, support the family's quest for answers and the justice which they will hopefully get one day. Thank you very much indeed from uh, for Paul for that and if you want to comment on the uh, on the on the Croydon tram crash please please do and if you want to comment on the inquest and maybe you've been involved in Grenfell and you know the form you believe an inquest should take and the importance of talking to the right people so that the victims and survivors families can 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 you know can hear the right questions being asked maybe that really is incredibly important and and, and brings a sense of closure plus a sense of justice being done 0800 731 2000 we'll take a trail and we'll be straight back